Chapter four focuses on displaying quantitative data. This slide just shows the data sets that we're going to be using for this set of notes. It's the number of home runs hit in a single season by three well-known baseball players, Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds, and Babe Ruth. Unlike categorical graphs, which only had two options, pie charts and bar charts, there's a number of different ways that we can display quantitative data. The first is a dot plot, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So here we have a dot plot of the number of home runs hit by Babe Ruth. Okay, we can see we have a scale, equally spaced numbers. We have a label or title across the bottom here. Uh, and then we have a dot over each um, data point. Okay, when we have more than one data point, like here at 41, we just stack our dots. Okay, we can put dots, we can put X's or any mark. When it comes to describing a quantitative distribution, we want to use an acronym known as SOX, S-O-C-S. Each of these letters stands for a word. The first S stands for shape. Okay, we want to describe the shape of the distribution in one of two ways. So we can say it's symmetric or approximately symmetric. That would be a graph like these over here. So this is unimodal and symmetric. This is actually uniform, but a uniform graph actually is symmetric. Okay, we can also say that it's skewed. Okay, these two graphs over here are skewed. Okay, it can be skewed to the left or it can be skewed to the right. You see that this graph here is skewed to the left because the tail is on the left. This one here is skewed to the right with the tail on the right. Okay, all those are the ways that we can describe the shape of a distribution. The O is for outliers. Outliers are observations that we would consider unusual or pieces that don't fit with the rest of the pattern. Okay, eventually we'll be able to use a mathematical way to identify outliers, but for now, we're just gonna pick them out visually and say that they may be outliers. So looking at this data, we have uh, his home runs, mainly centered around that stretch of, uh, of numbers there with these two low seasons in the low to mid 20s. Okay, those may be outliers. Okay, if we looked at Barry Bonds instead, uh, we see that we have one season where he hit uh, a very high number of home runs compared to all these other ones. The C in Sox is center. The center is just a typical value. We want one number that represents the full data set. Okay, so maybe something around here on this one as a single number that re represents all those dots. And rounding out socks, the last S is spread. Here we discuss the variation of the distribution. How spread out is the data? Is it clustered tightly together? Is it greatly varied? The simplest measure of spread is the range, and that's what you're uh, familiar with at this point. So that's what we use at least to start. It's actually not an appropriate measure of spread. We'll learn more measures of spread as we move forward uh, and replace range as we learn new ones. For now, uh, Babe Ruth's number of home runs in a single season varies from a low of 23 to a high of 60. That's how we'll describe the spread. Uh, but just a note, range is actually a single number. So when we described, if we were asked to give the range, uh, we would describe the range as 37. All right, so all of these four things we wrap up into a single paragraph, okay? We don't just list them. That's not how they want this on the AP exam. They want us to write it out, including context, as many of those W's as we can back from chapter two. So written out, it would be something like this statement here. The distribution of Babe Ruth's number of home runs in a single season is approximately symmetric with two possible unusual observations at 23 and 25 home runs. He typically hits about 46 home runs in a season, over his career, the number of home runs has varied from a low of 23 to a high of 60. Here we have all four of those things, shape, outlier, center, spread. Next type of display is a stem and leaf plot. Again, this is something that you've probably seen in a previous math class. Here we're gonna take each of these data points and we're gonna split them up to a stem and a leaf. So we have Hank Aaron's data, number of home runs. If we were to take this 13 here, we split it into two parts a stem and a leaf. The one is the stem, the three is the leaf. Okay, in our stem and leaf plot, okay, this line down in the center splits each of these numbers. So here we can see our 13. Okay, this 44, for example, is actually one of these fours. 
Okay, so we put them in order once we put them in our stem and leaf plot. And a stem and leaf plot actually shows the shape just like uh, a histogram, uh, which we haven't talked about, or a dot plot would. Okay, so this is skewed to the left because the tail is towards the lower end. Okay, if you were to imagine looking that at that on its side, if we were to tilt it over and view it with a one, two, three, four on the bottom uh, instead of on the left, we could see that tail is on the left side. There's a few different ways we can make stem and leaf plots. Uh, we can do back-to-back -back stem plots where we compare two players in a single stem plot. So here we have Hank Aaron on the left, Babe Ruth on the right, and then a single set of stems in the middle. Okay, this is also a, a, what's called a split stem plot, which we have over here, okay, where we take each stem and we split it into two parts, right? So the first stem would be everything from 10 to 14 home runs, and this second stem would be 15 to 19. So again, this next one would be 20 to 24, and then 25 to 29. Okay, in a split stem, we just break them up. It allows us to see the distribution a little better. So again, we have a distribution that's skewed to the left. Okay, all of these are really skewed to the left. When it comes to advantages and disadvantages of dot plots and stem plots, the advantages are stem plots and most dot plots, but not all, preserves each piece of data. Okay, we can see the actual data in a stem plot. Uh, in a lot of dot plots, we can see what the actual data is, but it depends on how large the scale is. Uh, it also shows features of the distribution with regards to shape. So we can see, is it symmetric? Is it skewed? Are there gaps, et cetera? Disadvantage, if we have a big data set, we wouldn't want to use one of these displays. It would just take us too long to make. Okay. Also, if we have data that's widely varied and really spread out, these graphs can be a pain. Next up is histograms. These are probably the most common graphs for quantitative data. It looks like a bar chart with the main difference that in a histogram, the bars don't touch each other. And the reason they don't touch each other is that in a histogram, we're not allowed to rearrange the order of the bars. We're in a bar chart if we're talking about eye color. It's okay if we were to take blue eyes and put it at the back of the chart and put take brown eyes and put it first. So here's a histogram for the number of home runs hit by Barry Bonds in a season. So there's a number of things to point out here. So first looking at this, we can see we have a shape that at first looks skewed to the right. However, this is really approximately symmetric with an outlier. Okay, we have this outlier here uh, between 71 and 76. If we look at the histogram, uh, if we look at the actual data, we can see that it's at 73. Now this histogram is created using a frequency table. Okay, and this frequency table is made up of classes. So we take our data and we split it into classes, which are pretty much just buckets. And changing these buckets is gonna change how this histogram looks. So if those buckets got bigger or smaller, wider or narrower, uh, it'll change the shape of our histogram. So choosing the width of those uh, kind of determines uh, how that first letter of socks uh, plays out in our description. So our first class is 16 to 20. And when we look through here, we look at how many seasons did Barry Bonds score between 16 and 20 home runs. So he scored one, two, uh, and that's it. So there's a frequency of two seasons where he scored between 16 and 20 home runs. Then we move on to 21 to 25. Okay, so 25, 24, that's two. 25 again, that's three. All right, so three seasons where he scored between 21 and 25. If we look at this bar, there's a height of three, the previous one had a height of two. Uh, you can see on the scale here that it has uh, 0.5 there, which uh, it doesn't really make sense. We would never have a season with 0.5, uh, but that's just how it was drawn out, okay? Um, along the bottom, we have, always have a label there. Okay, it really would say frequency along the side over here, and then a title up top. A lot of times we'll be given just the graph without the frequency table like we have on this slide. And often they'll leave out the actual data as well. And we'll have to answer questions about it. So one thing to note is that we should be able to recreate that frequency table. We can never get this back and find out what the actual data is if we don't have it, but we could recreate that table and say that there were 
two seasons where Barry Bonds hit between 16 and 20 home runs. Now, as a note, each bar here starts with a number to the left of it. So this class goes from 16 to the number just below the number to the right. So it goes from 16 to 20. Okay, this next bar goes from 21 to 25. Okay, this gap here is from 26 to 30, etc. This is discrete data. It's not possible for Barry Bonds to have a season where he hit like 30.4 home runs. It's either 30 or 31, so there's no in-between there. Another type of graph is a time plot where the x-axis is specifically allocated to time. So here we have a time plot for the number of home runs hit by Barry Bonds. Uh, and in a graph like this, we're looking for trends. And we can see that over time, Barry Bonds was hitting more home runs. Uh, we later found out that this was because as he got later into his career, uh, he was using steroids.